from a design perspective, should should our cities be fun? Yes. <laughs> like I mean, I, I can't imagine what it would. Uh, I, I just, I mean, it just it, it 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 provides so much quality of life to have a fun city. Um, uh, I, I, I mean, Copenhagen is also lauded as, you know, one of the most livable cities in the world. So, you know, we're speaking from an incredibly privileged position. So, like, I, I don't want to undermine what it is, but it's also really enjoyable having, you know, amazing public spaces, like especially in summer, just seeing how active and alive the city is. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Summerman, and that is Robert Martin, uh, architect with Yaya Architects in Copenhagen, Denmark. And uh, we are gonna be talking about uh, mobility and uh, going on a mobility diet. And the mobility diet pyramid that they have created. <laughs> it's a fun conversation, and I'm really delighted that you have tuned in for this. Uh, it's a long one, so let's get right to it with Robert Martin. Enjoy. Robert Martin, it is an absolute pleasure to have you on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Robert, I'd love to have my uh, guests to sort of uh, introduce themselves briefly. So uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to you and let you uh, introduce yourself to the audience. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Um, well, my name is Robert Martin. Uh, I'm an architect and currently the head of mobility at Yaya Architects. Uh, we're an architecture and urban planning firm based in Copenhagen, Denmark. I'm originally Australian, but uh, I've been living here in Copenhagen for the past 10 years. Fantastic. That's great. So uh, what really kind of interested you in this line of work? I mean, what, what's that sort of origin story of, that brought you to doing this sort of stuff? Yeah, it's really interesting and almost quite organic uh, because I grew up uh, in say the outskirts of Sydney in Australia. I wouldn't quite call it rural, but uh, definitely the town I was in was only 4,000 people. And growing up, uh, there was a train line, but it wasn't really that well connected. So it was a very, let's say, car dependent place to live. And then it was actually quite funny because uh, when I moved to Sydney to study my undergraduate, I had a car but I had sold it within a year because I just became incredibly frustrated with finding parking, constantly being stuck in traffic. And I also had discovered cycling. So it just was a little bit organic that uh, I kind of dropped the car for the bike. If we fast forward a little bit, uh, moving to Copenhagen, the pieces started to come together on how can we create, you know, much more livable cities, much more fun cities, much more enjoyable cities to be in if we can, start to think of mobility outside that kind of realm of automobiles and start to promote more active forms of transport because it i can really say that my quality of life since moving here has definitely improved as a result of it. and what brought you to Co copenhagen uh, the first time uh, i was actually lucky enough to be awarded a uh, scholarship through the sydney opera house maybe it's not so well known amongst your audience but it's uh, quite a landmark architectural project in sydney um, and something that the city is very proud of. Uh, but it was actually designed by a Danish architect, Johan Utzen. And the unfortunate fact about the project is he never saw it completed because of a kind of political turmoil which saw him actually being fired off the project. Uh, so for the 40th anniversary, um, the Sydney Opera House, in combination with a lot of uh, partners, uh, both in Australia and in Denmark, decided to launch a scholarship that would send uh, Australian architects to Denmark and Danish architects to Australia to somewhat rebuild that relationship that had developed in the 1970s. And I was lucky enough to receive the first uh, one. So I was kind of taken on this uh, six week whirlwind trip uh, where I got to visit many of Woodson's kind of masterpieces uh, within uh, Europe. But I had this feeling in the back of my head that I didn't just want it to be a six week trip. So I actually only bought a one way ticket. Um, thinking that I could probably find a job uh, within six weeks. And uh, I, was, I was lucky enough to find a job uh, with the Danish architecture firm Henning Larsen. Okay. The only kind of catch was is that job was in Saudi Arabia. So I kind of had, uh, I had kind of um, made the plan to uh, move to, uh, to Copenhagen and then had to call home and say, actually, I'm moving to Saudi Arabia. 
uh, and I was there <laughs> oh for six gosh. months. Yeah, and if you want to talk about a lack of active mobility, at least yeah. back in uh, 2014, uh, Saudi Arabia, Riyadh is, is definitely uh, one of those places. Wow, um, fascinating, yeah. But anyway, uh, after, after that, I kind of, you know, uh, was able to go back to the Copenhagen office. Uh, right, right. Copenhagen. Yeah, yeah. So, um, that, that was it. so talk a little bit about that. You know, that it sounds like, you know, at least from the, the, the town, the city that you were, you know, raised in. And I also was in a, a small city of, uh, I think our, our town population was like 4,000 people. And I actually lived on a small ranch outside of town and, you know, but it was only like two miles outside of town. If I really had to, I could walk it or, or ride the bike in. But what was that like, you know, going from that environment uh, to, you know, sort of that car free environment, you know, the, the college, <laughs> you know, active mobility introduction. And, and that's not uncommon to, you know, to get that, hear that of that. Oh, yeah. When I went to, to college, I sort of adapted a, a car light lifestyle, active mobility lifestyle. But then, you know, that culture shock of actually making that move to uh, to Copenhagen and having the active mobility be so central to everyday life. What, what was that like culturally for you? And, and was it a shock or was it like welcome? Well, I think I'd been cycling in Sydney for about five years before moving to Copenhagen. So it was actually quite natural to adopt it. Um, I, I can reflect more on the transition from kind of where I grew up to Sydney a little bit more because it was, first of all, incredibly fun and, uh, and incredibly freeing because, you know, being somewhat dependent uh, on an, like a vehicle, dependent on parking, dependent on traffic and money, you know, was a little bit uh, limiting. And then all of a sudden I had the freedom, uh, especially with large groups of friends, to kind of move without the city, be spontaneous about what we, what we wanted to do, maybe be a little bit more freer with socializing. It was incredibly amazing. And I think... Uh, moving to Copenhagen, actually, what I what I experienced is it became a lot more relaxed, actually. So I had this like uh, single speed uh, kind of racer uh, when I was in Sydney because I was kind of used to battling through traffic, having to avoid buses, right? Being constantly aware, and then all of a sudden, when I moved to Copenhagen, I bought this somewhat uh, Amsterdam, Amsterdam style, you know, heavy steel bike because I thought, oh, I don't need to go anywhere quick you know, this can be relaxed. You know, it was really, it was really, really nice. Well, and I'm glad you mentioned that too, because that's one of the, the common themes that we talk about here on the Active Towns podcast and on the channel in general is that difference in sort of approach to active mobility. Uh, in North America, you, we kind of get caught up in that same sort of rat race sort of theme in, in in certain areas in the UK, the same thing of where, yeah, it's like, oh, this is a race, you know, it's like, <laughs> this is like urban warfare sort of thing in terms of being on a bike in that environment, because it seems like you're doing battle, but then you sort of really have to shift gears and downshift and like take a deep breath and relax and get on that upright bike and maybe even a step through frame <laughs> and, you know, just realize that, oh yeah, you know, it's not a race. We don't have to race off the line to, to try to, you know, position ourselves in front of the driver, in front of the cars. It, it's, it really is a, a, a much more um, comfortable environment where you can actually dress for your destination in your normal clothes. And you're not having to get on, you know, donning cycling gear. So, yeah, it's, it, it's an interesting thing. But I think it's it, it, it's also a little bit, I would find the drivers in Copenhagen quite respectful uh, of cyclists, which makes the experience much more enjoyable. And this is also, say, represented by CU Heat, by who you see cycling, um, right? Like it's, it's not just uh, mammals, uh, as you might experience in many places around the world, but... Uh, well, uh, go ahead, you know, go ahead and go ahead and define this since that's an acronym. Go ahead and define. Yeah, it yeah, now, exactly. please. yeah, yeah, I didn't know how to do it, but I think it's uh, middle aged men in Lycra, right? Like, you know, the Saturday morning uh, kind of groups of men dominating uh, the roads that often causes conflicts, I would say, uh, with motorists. Um, and we're, and we're agnostic here on, on the Active mm -hmm. Towns channel where, you know, if, Hey, if you're getting out on your bike, that's awesome. You know, 
go for it. It's that's, that's great. That's the key thing is more people writing more often. And if that's what you love to do, that's great. So we're, we're not criticizing at all. <laughs> so. I, I wear Lycra like uh, on weekends, I have uh, multiple bikes. Uh, so I will not, um, yeah, I will not use it as in a derogatory way, but maybe to identify a certain group Correct. that uh, cyclists are often kind of grouped in with. Yeah. Good stuff. Okay. So your current firm, you, you, so I, I love this too. And I, I'm very fascinated by the fact that you're an architect, but you're interested in mobility and you're the director of mobility in your current firm. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. And how does that happen? How does the architect become a mobility person? Um, uh, it was quite lucky for me actually that Yaya were already, uh, thinking about mobility because back in 2016, I would say that um, they were somewhat of a traditional architecture and urban planning uh, company. And I think there are two kind of key projects that made them reconsider the way that transport works in cities. The first is actually uh, this parking house uh, that uh, is in the background of our webpage or yeah, our webpage just there. Um, and as you can see, maybe from the top of it, it's not your ordinary parking house. It's, uh, it's actually like an active roofscape uh, as a way to kind of create new types of public spaces in cities. But the other project, uh, which is maybe more like um, systemic thought uh, that they had, was that they were doing a master plan in Orlesund in Norway. And there was a lot of kind of ambitions for this to be a sustainable urban development. And there was somewhat of an experience that even though the initial master plan, say, you know, had little cars integrated into them, once it kind of went through planning processes, uh, brought in the road authorities, traffic engineers, a lot of the kind of standards that you would find uh, in, in kind of city developments, such as like parking norms, uh, minimum road, road widths, discussions about capacity and flow of vehicles that eroded a lot of those ambitions uh, in the project. And that was frustrating in one sense, but also there was a lot of discussions at the same time about, say, autonomous vehicles, mobility as a service, you know, micro mobility in the kind of expanded view of lightweight, ele lightweight electric vehicles. And there was a frustration that okay, we're designing this master plan now and it won't be ready, you know, fully implemented for 15 years. And yet the tools that we're using to plan transport within it, are, you know, based, you know, off 50 years ago, right? And so there was a little bit of this, you know, frustration, but inability to actually join that conversation and kind of argue against it. So EIA decided to uh, kind of found this mobility team uh, and they invited me to lead it which was initially through research, then through an industrial PhD, uh, which I'm sure we can touch on a bit later. And then from that, the knowledge kind of gained out of those projects, we were able to launch uh, like a consultancy team uh, within the company. Fantastic. Yeah. So go ahead and dive into that uh, industrial P PhD as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, it's a it's an interesting um, idea that we have in Denmark. Uh, I think it's also in other countries around the world that essentially uh, what the setup is, is that it's co-financed by a company, but in exchange for that co-financing, I don't have any teaching obligations or I didn't have any teaching obligations. And instead of teaching, those hours were spent working at the company. So the idea is to kind of have a greater dissemination of the research straight into kind of commercial practice. And that's just generally a, an idea that uh, Denmark is trying to do to kind of, you know, bolster kind of innovation by actually having that uh, greater tie together between industry and academia. And, and I'd like to dive into a, a little bit more details about the, the yaya -ya and, and, and really the, the different areas that you're interested in. But before we do that, I just have to comment that yeah, this is really cool. This image with the activity uh, centers on the top of the structure. It's what I ca would call in my terminology, uh, an activity asset. It's a, it's a, it's a piece of, of hardware, uh, you know, an actual 
park, something physical in the built environment that you can point to and say, yeah, that's something that is is out there that can encourage healthy, active living, a culture of activity, if you will. And that's kind of the hardware. The software side of stuff uh, from in my terminology with activity assets are the policies and programs and incentive uh, uh, initiatives that help to activate spaces like this. But I think this is super cool that, you know, that you have that innovation and that the firm literally has this as <laughs> the, the landing page image to the website. Very, very yeah, cool. Yeah, exactly. So, so tell more uh, about Yaya and really the, the, the main areas of business that y'all are in. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, we're a, a company of about 25 people um, and that's a mix of kind of um, the founding partners, uh, architects, building constructors, uh, landscape architects and planners, right? And so we kind of have a, a, a broad uh, portfolio of resources that we're able to tap in with, into in our projects. There are, there are three kind of what we call pillars of sustainability that have somewhat naturally emerged for us, um, but also as a way for us to define ourselves as a practice because I think all uh, kind of companies throughout the world should have a sustainability agenda, especially in the current climate crisis. And I think architects generally um, have that ambition to do good in the world, but maybe as you uh, come into uh, working life, you realize that our agency, where we're actually able to kind of create impact is, is limited in some scope. Um, so we kind of defined our three uh, as uh, biomaterials, uh, where as much as possible, uh, we try and utilize uh, timber, uh, bioengineered products, you know, the reduction of steel and concrete because of that uh, effect it has on resource depletion and CO2 uh, and energy costs. Uh, transformation, where the most sustainable building is the one you don't build. You know, there's an extremely large amount of, you know, built uh, fabric within the world that we need to better utilize instead of simply tearing it down uh, and rebuilding. Uh, so, you know, also in terms of saving CO2, but also preserving a lot of those like spatial qualities that we find in buildings that, you know, we won't find anymore. And then the third being uh, mobility, which is my baby, I guess. And uh, that is more the kind of larger systematic view that cities are kind of comprised of their mobility systems. And that's what kind of makes them work and provides like the kind of living quality. So the nice thing about us having these three pillars is it means that we're able to kind of work across scales in terms of impact. We can go right down to the small kind of detail of, of like a, a, a joint between two pieces of structural timber all the way up to advising cities for regional policy on mobility uh, and everything in between. Yeah. Yeah. And it looks like on this particular project uh, that I zoomed in on here, uh, we've got uh, the construction of sort of a whimsical activity asset. Is this like a school setting? Mm, it's actually a conference center and like event space. Um, I think what's actually not shown in this image is that it's part of a new bus rapid transport line okay. um, uh -huh. in Ulbo, which is a northern city in Denmark. And it was actually to reorientate uh, the entrance to the um uh, to the building to kind of align with the bus rapid transport. So actually this kind of running track uh, actually like directly kind of links that bus stop into the center. And then what's kind of cool about it is it's not just simply kind of a wayfinding exercise, but also how do we create spaces for people to use? How do we activate an otherwise backside to a building and, you know, create those spaces for people to inhabit? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's whimsical too. It's got, it's, it's kind of fun. Well, Hey, just to keep things fun and interesting, we decided to change your background. You were actually being chased by the sun. So, <laughs> and, and as, as you mentioned off camera, um, the, you know, you can't complain too much because if you, if you have sun, you want to, you know, thank you very much for, for, for shining. <laughs> so, um, I, I did want to, uh, talk a little bit about the mobility work that you're doing. And one of the things that talk, that you have been really presenting about publicly recently is this concept of a mobility pyramid. I'm thinking it'd be fun to sort of introduce this concept uh, with a short little video that you did. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'll be sure to include the video link uh, in the show notes to this interview, uh, to this video, as well as in the show notes uh, for the audio only version of this podcast. But uh, it, 
Is that okay? You want to give that a try and play that video? That'll give our voices a little bit of a break here and, uh, and, and we'll have some fun. Let's get this queued up here. As we're doing this, uh, why don't you give a little context behind uh, what we're about to see here? Mm. Yeah, so this was a video shot uh, by Urban Next, which is a kind of online platform run by the publisher Acta. Um, and uh, it was while I was at the Smart City World Expo in Barcelona, uh, in, yeah, as you can see here on the screen now. Um, and, and I was there presenting as part of uh, EIT Urban Mobility. Uh, and they uh, caught up with me to talk about uh, the work that we do at Yaya. Fantastic. We won't play the entire video. So again, uh, I encourage everybody to uh, click through to the links to be able to see the entire video. But we'll play like the, the first minute or so, um, because I think it's a good introduction to what we're about to talk about in terms of the, the detailed work that you are currently doing. So let's hit play. My name is Robert Martin. I'm the head of mobility at Yaya Architects. We're a small architecture and design firm based in Copenhagen, Denmark. One of the ways in which we try and talk about the future of mobility uh, is through a mobility diet. And the reason why we use this analogy of a diet is because we think that the discussion around mobility is often very black and white. It's very much a car versus bike versus public transport. And, you know, there's not much in between, right? As soon as we hear, you know, removing one parking space, a lot of people get very angry and that's the end of the discussion. But we don't think mobility is black and white. We think it's much more like a diet where we understand that you can have certain levels of car use in cities because we know that some people need a car, uh, but that shouldn't be the majority. Uh, you know, just like a diet, it should be in moderation. And if we actually treat mobility in cities like a diet and kind of focus much more on the green modes, the kind of the cycling, the walking, uh, the shared modes of mobility, our cities can be much more healthy as a result. What I also like about the analogy of a diet, and especially in relation to the food pyramid, uh, the food pyramid is, is something that we've all grown up with. But what we would have seen over time as we grow up is that food pyramid has actually been changing. You would have seen like meat was probably at the bottom with vegetables as kind of a key element of our diet, but now it's at the top because we've kind of had an understanding that it's not good for our environment. It's not good for us to kind of have that as a foundation of our diet, so it's moved around. And we think that's good about the mobility diet as well. Like we have a plane on it, which we obviously get criticized about in terms of its um, CO2 impact. But you know, this technology can change over time. And so it might appear off or we might discover a new biofuel and it comes down. You know, it's a much more kind of dynamic way to think about it, both in terms of time, but also in terms of context. I live in Copenhagen and we have a very rich cycling culture, but we also have a very flat, small city. So, you know, that's why cycling works there. And you can't expect that to necessarily be replicated in other environments. So that's why that mobility diet can look different in different places. You just need to understand what that context is before you're starting to think about what the diet should be. And we'll put, press play at that at, at that point. And I encourage everybody to, to watch the rest of the video. It's a tremendously a fantastic video. And so everyone should do that. Um, assuming we were able to show that video, <laughs> uh, this got introduced. You were referencing uh, mobility as a diet and uh, introduced that concept of a mobility pyramid. Uh, talk a little bit more about this work that you're doing and, and, and why this is relevant for cities around the globe from a sustainability perspective. Yeah, it's, it's actually quite funny because we, we made it uh, quite quickly uh, because they recently re-released uh, the food pyramid here in Denmark. Uh, there's like a supermarket chain called Co-op uh, and that's the one in Denmark that uh, people grew up with. And, and we just thought it was a nice analogy, this idea of a uh, mobility diet. Uh, now, there are other kind of mobility pyramids uh, floating around. Uh, there's also this one, which is the inverted mobility pyramid, I think, which tries to discuss it more in terms of the level of hierarchy. 
Whereas what we're, we're not trying to talk about in terms of hierarchy, we're, we're trying to talk about it in diet, right? We're trying to say that it, it's totally fine for people to drive, but that is not really what should be the default. You know, it's totally fine to accept that there are groups that rely on a car, but once again, that shouldn't be the, the, the kind of default. If we can start to think about, you know, more multi group systems, which are much more focused on active mobility, uh, public transport, and then, you know, cars, planes, where those systems don't necessarily work, you know, we can start to create cities which are much higher uh, in quality. It's really taken off. I think people, it helps people understand what this future is that we're trying to describe. You know, I think, I, I don't know if it's a trend in America, but um, there have certainly been trends in Europe about, say, meat-free Mondays. Uh, and people can accept that, you know, they're like, oh, great. Yeah, I eat meat once less a week. And, and that could be the same with mobility, right? I mean, people just think, okay, I could, I could take public transport, I could cycle, I could walk to work, you know, one day a week because that's probably manageable. And, you know, if, if society did that, that actually has a huge impact, right? Because if we can think at the individual but then understand it uh, at the societal level, these small little shifts can actually have large effects. Right, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it actually is kind of brilliant in the sense that, you know, when we think about the mobility pyramid and, and, you know, the, 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 the mobility or the, uh, the diet, you know, pyramid is that, you know, the foundation of the pyramid, the foundation of, of your go-to activities are hopefully going to be active mobility and those, those, those quote unquote greener choices. And to your point, you know, hopefully, you know, using that single occupancy vehicle is, you know, is done sparingly <laughs> similar to, you know, indulging in that, um, that meat or dairy product, you know, or, you know, or, or, or a, a dessert or something like that, you know, uh, whatever's at the top of the pyramid these days. And, and likewise, you know, getting on an airplane, hopefully getting on an airplane is not something that you are doing on a regular, regular basis. Uh, you know, so doing it sparingly. So I, I think it's a beautiful analogy and, and brilliant in that sense. What has been the reaction uh, to this as you've been presenting this and talking about this around the globe? Uh, it's been quite positive. As I said, I think most people can understand it. I think some people read it a little bit too literally sometimes, uh, like maybe it's a policy document and they think, okay, maybe that electric car should be a bit higher. Maybe this should come down. But in some ways, maybe that's missing the point uh, because we're not trying to be so dogmatic with it. We're just trying to say that uh, you know, if we focus on walking, if we focus on cycling, if we you know take public transport less and drive less, that's, that's generally a way to do it. But I think it's also been funny because people, uh, there, was a, there was a company, I think, in Argentina that stole it. They uh, changed the color scheme and replaced our logo. And in some way that's frustrating, but also it's nice that it becomes... Uh, uh, yeah. like it resonates with people yeah. um, because I guess that's the, the, the flattery part. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And also just the yeah. message kind of is spread, right? Because I think when you're working within the green transition and trying to work with sustainability, it's more important that they get the job gets done, right? Rather than who does it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I'm sure that that can be a, a bit frustrating at times when, when that's, that sort of thing happens. But I, again, I guess getting that information out is, is absolutely critical. And that's the same thing that I run into all the time with, you know, content creation is sometimes folks will actually reach out to me and say, Hey, is it okay if I steal this and use this? And I'm like, Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, sometimes I don't ever hear and I just, you know, find out later. That's fine too. But I actually, I mean, this has been one of the, I would say, kind of key parts of, let's call it Yaya success up until now is the ability to communicate a lot of these messages quite simply. Uh, I don't want to say viral because it, it hasn't gone that way at all, but, you know, we're constantly trying to think how we can actually create this message and spread it. Like, for instance, we had a, uh, uh, we've recently had a new government here. And so we had a new transport minister. Uh, and so we made this meme, which was um, make mobility green again as a hat, right? Uh, and then we kind of wanted to present it to him as a way to um, uh, kind of bring it on. And we're constantly thinking about these like ways that we can use communication, especially through social media to engage people and, and kind of talk to them. Right. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. One of the things that I wanted to, to also do is give you an opportunity to talk a little bit more in depth about the types of projects that, that you're working on within Yaya. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, it, it ranges quite a lot. Uh, actually, um, we have uh, kind of traditional clients like municipalities and uh, property developers. Uh, but then we also have new mobility clients, uh, which is really interesting to work with. Um, so like shared e-scooter companies, so shared micro mobility companies, uh, shared um, uh, shared uh, car companies. And, and, and the kind of work we do for them is a little bit different to what we would do for a property developer in that a lot of what they're interested in is how to actually engage with cities and talk to them. Like for instance, you know, a, a company that isn't necessarily used to engaging with municipalities and working with public space might have difficult time uh, understanding what the kind of ambitions and the, the kind of what is important to the municipalities. And we basically work with these uh, companies to help them align with city goals, help them to understand like, the service or product that they're offering, how does it actually contribute to what the municipality would actually do within the city rather than kind of disrupting it? Right. Yeah. One of the things that I find fascinating is that interaction and, and where the visions of the architects and the city planners and the designers then come into uh, work with the transportation and mobility engineers. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, it's definitely a collaborative effort. I think um, early on when I, uh, I came into uh, the space, I was quite critical of transport engineers because I perceived them maybe as a little bit uh, as the kind of root cause of the problem. Whereas as I've matured, I guess I would say within it, I've seen that actually you need that collaboration um, uh, between uh, what we do, which is a lot about visioning, uh, trying to create these longer plans and actually the transport engineers that have like really good knowledge on how to implement solutions, uh, how to understand mobility networks, uh, etc. And so I would actually say that one of the main ways that we've been working together uh, on projects is through this uh, methodology that we've been trying to employ called backcasting. For those of you that don't know backcasting, it's basically the opposite of forecasting, where I would definitely criticize forecasting um, as a method because how I understand it is that you take historical data, uh, you make some assumptions, and then you project it into the future. And that projection is often seen as a truth. Uh, and those assumptions which led to that uh, projection aren't necessarily uh, so transparent. But what backcasting does is it actually starts with that future. You know, you develop that vision uh, with the necessary stakeholders. You kind of agree on what that vision is. You um, build up coalition and support, and then you develop pathways to get there. It's actually a very normal way for an architect to think, actually, where you kind of, you know, you do this vision for a building, and then you start, okay, how do we actually do it, right? How do we, how do we construct this thing? And it's basically applying that. So to kind of then involve engineers, it's, it's, it's instead of like starting it today and projecting forward, we're trying to work with what is that future and then working with them, how to actually figure out to get there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm lingering on this shot just to get some clarification as to uh, where is this uh, photo? Yeah, sure. It's actually uh, in downtown Copenhagen. If you just go back one slide, um, uh, the reason why this is included is because I think when people think of Copenhagen, they think of this image, right? Uh, this is definitely how the city is sold internationally. But if you go to the next one, um, yeah, no, this, what is, this is the Co this is the Copenhagen I I I can relate to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because you've actually seen uh, like a like a steady increase in the number of cars over the city over the last twenty years, which is. My assumption is it's linked to the city becoming a lot richer. It was essentially bankrupt uh, in the early 2000s. And as people get richer, they buy cars. And this is more the experience of the day-to-day. -day. It's not quite uh, like Amsterdam, for instance. Um, it's, it's a little bit more of a battle. And, and it is a little bit more of a battle. And it is a little bit more of this tension and negotiation between uh, the different modes. 
And it, it also demonstrates a little bit of the arrogance of space that is dedicated to the movement and storage of automobiles. And we can talk a little bit about the effort to try to decrease the number of uh, surface uh, or on-street parking spaces as well in the city. But I like to say that uh, just like with Rotterdam, uh, Copenhagen is a wonderful example for cities around the world, whether it be in North America or Australia, New Zealand and, and the UK, where you have environments that are very car centric and very car dependent. Copenhagen is a wonderful example because it isn't, you know, it isn't like old town historic Amsterdam where the streets, everything's super, super narrow. You do have areas of the city that are, look like this. And so you're working to try to create a healthier, uh, more sustainable balance in the midst of this. So I, I kind of point to Copenhagen as a, as a wonderful example for those cities that are uh, struggling to carve out space for uh, creating active mobility and a culture of activity. Would you agree with that, that premise? <laughs> In somewhat. I, I actually think um, it's a relevant point to pull up this LinkedIn post where you actually um, found me because it's it's this exact street, actually, or this road. Oh, it is. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, when you pull it up, it's, it's kind of interesting to talk about because the city's current plan is actually to bury that road in a tunnel. Um, right. And then of, to create like, a, a green is. space on top. Yeah. 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 It's like... Um, and, and in some ways, you know, it, it makes sense because then cars have less of an impact in some ways. Uh, but as you can see, actually, in this image, um, the kind of on and off ramps uh, going for it actually kind of completely tear up uh, the space. So that is, yeah, I would say that's about 50 meters away from where that uh, photo that you just showed was taken. And, and actually what a lot of the studies show is that it's going to actually like it's going to induce demand. It's, it's going to increase the amount of car use, uh, potentially limiting public transport and cy cycling. Um, and, and I just think it's, it's extremely crazy that a city which prides itself so much on its cycling culture would, would do a project which, which is extremely expensive and, and build it. Yeah. Now this post was over a month ago. Uh, what's the status of this? Is this moving forward or has, has enough people, you know, spoke up to, to hopefully, you know, quash this as a, as a plan? Yeah, unfortunately not. Uh, to give you context about the post, it was actually because the city were debating whether to move ahead with the project or not. Uh, after the initial feasibility study, um, which showed that, um, uh, you know, it would have these negative uh, kind of implications. Um, but like, I mean, I, I think that I did a little bit too little too late in that respect. Uh, um, not actually thinking that, you know, a lot of these parties here have sustainability agendas. Like if you look at the politicians uh, who voted yes for this, it's like, you know, they want to create, um, you know, a sustainable city, reduce CO2, they want to increase uh, cycling, reduce cars, and then they vote yes on something like this. So it's not to say that it's going ahead, uh, but it's definitely going to the next stage um, of analysis. Yeah, yeah. And you did mention in, in that post uh, that you praised the municipality for moving forward with elim eliminating, um, you know, on-street parking spots, which I think is a, a trend that we're seeing in multiple cities globally, uh, including Oslo and Amsterdam and many more. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm, I'm really happy that uh, they're doing it because they're trying to reactivate like downtowns, which are uh, probably facing a lot of issues at the moment in terms of changing consuming habits, right? Like there's a lot of movement to e-commerce, which is probably taking people away from the city center. So we need to start redefining city centers as places of experience. And you don't have places of experience if all the public spaces are just littered with cars. So it's nice that we're able to do this. The only unfortunate thing is, is that when you look at um, CO2, very little of it is actually kind of created in the city center. It's much more of the kind of surrounding neighborhoods. So we need to think about, you know, removing parking, right? Definitely. But then we also need kind of strategies which can have an impact in the greater area. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> I mean, when you see this type of, of environment, you know, regardless of the city, you know, globally, and we're, we look at again, 
the, I called it earlier, the air against the space uh, allocation to the movement and storage of automobiles. This is a nice way to you know, sort of highlight that. We, we can look at our public space. And again, thinking, reframing our thought processes of our streets as public space is incredibly important because it's, it's reframing it. It's like, you know, we are really acknowledging the fact that streets have been in existence for thousands of years, essentially, as long as we have been, uh, you know, in villages and creating habitation uh, locations. And so it's, it's really that automobiles are a recent invader of, you know, the last hundred years or so. So again, reframing, it doesn't have to be that we can, we can create a new future, uh, like you said, backcasting, saying, what is it we want our spaces to look like? And then let's, let's backcast and let's figure this out. Let's plan this out. Let's, let's lean into those architects <laughs> to help us out and designers to help us out and then turn to the engineers and say, okay, how, how do we make this happen and ensure that it's done properly and safely? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, it's a good point about uh, public space in the streets because I think um, streets and roads are actually the kind of largest public space that cities have. You know, it is like, a, it's like a, a common asset, right? I mean, the city owns it, so that means the people own it. And yet we kind of give it over to objects which sit still, you know, 90 something, whatever report you read percent of the time. I think it's funny though, if you like the previous uh, kind of image is what we describe as the 100% car based diet, right? So we, we use these two drawings to kind of go from what is a mobility diet conceptually and what does it look like in space? And if you go to the next image, um, this is basically, you know, how we imagine this could look like, right? Where, you know, car, car owners don't need to get completely scared. There is some levels of car parking, but there's much more space for shared cars. Because we know yeah, the I mean, it, it, yeah, if we zoom in a little bit, we can see, you know, right here down at the bottom, we've got, it looks like a, a, an electric car charging station. And this looks like it's also a shared car situation. So we're able to help uh, facilitate, um, you know, car light lifestyles as well. And, and again, because it, we don't have to be dogmatic and say that, you know, automobiles are evil and they have to be completely eliminated. The reality, as we uh, alluded to in the mobility pyramid, is that there are going to be some people who are, you know, going to need to be able to do that. But we can do so in a much more balanced and healthful way that's, you know, much more sustainable for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, cars have done, uh, uh, you know, a lot of good for society as well, right? Like, you know, it, it definitely allowed people to connect and socialize in new ways. It, it certainly opened up new economic opportunities for new people. It's basically what we're experiencing now with the internet, right? This is what happened at the beginning of the 20th century. The only problem is, is that we became addicted to it in some sense. Uh, and now we're experiencing a lot of those uh, negative externalities. Um, but that's why we need to rethink the way we move in cities. Yeah. 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 Is there anything that we haven't yet discussed that you really want to hone in on? Um, I think uh, I would like to kind of talk about the second part of our working methodology, right? Um, because we've already mentioned backcasting. Um, I think, yeah, it might be in this slideshow actually, like a way to describe it. Uh, it's, it's kind of at the end, how do we get there if you want to pull it up? But otherwise, what we're kind of talking about is that it's, it's, it's a little bit easy to show these pictures, you know, of kids playing in the street, lots of trees, getting rid of cars, but, you know, we don't know. So this is the kind of backcasting model, right? Um, you know, where we kind of jump to the future and come back. And if you go to the next slide, uh, this is then say prototyping or piloting where we essentially, you know, we have these assumptions about the way we want to develop cities, but so we take that vision of the future and we actually place it in the present, right? At a very small scale so that we can, you know, test it. We can get user feedback. We can find out what works and what doesn't. And then we can actually kind of scale these solutions to come up, right? If you go to the next slide, you can see how we're completely thinking about it, right? 
you know, we're, we're thinking that you always need to have these kind of long-term visions, right? You kind of need to have an idea of where you're going or else you're just going to be wandering around aimlessly. But at the same time, you're constantly testing that, right? So that vision for the future should never be fixed. It should be agile, right? So that you can kind of pivot when you kind of gain more knowledge. And I think that's really the way that we're trying to work with this. Uh, right. Like they're really trying well, to and develop. I think, I think it's also important too, to, to acknowledge the fact that, um, this is one of the ways that, uh, we, the people can hold our leaders accountable for the commitments that they've made. Uh, so as an example, uh, you know, being able to say that, you know, Hey leaders, you are saying that it's important for you to, uh, abide by becoming more sustainable and, uh, you know, being accountable to trying to do something about, um, you know, climate change. Well, you know, are you do, are you using that? Are you backcasting? And then are you prototyping and are you doing this cycle of, of moving things forward or is it just lip service? Yeah, of course. I think the other, the, I mean, politicians love data points, right? I mean, they essentially need it to make decisions unless you have very visionary leaders uh, who can just essentially do things. And, and that's what these pilot projects can do, right? You know, you can start to gather the data uh, and the evidence needed for like political leaders to actually make these big changes so they can feel confident that they're not going to lose a lot of votes and essentially lose their job, but, you know, be assured that they make the right decisions. Well, and also, you know, speaks to the point that being able to do something, being able to prototype actually helps better communicate to the community because that they need that as well. They need to be able to, to, you know, continue to be able to grasp something of, you know, what change looks like so that they can continue to communicate and stay uh, focused and steadfast with their desire to see a built environment that looks different. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, I mean, that's a very good point that you made. Uh, and I think uh, we discussed this earlier uh, off camera uh, about behavior change and the fact that that is kind of where your background is, because I actually think um, behavior change on the short term is going to have like a lot more effect and impact than kind of redesigning cities, because redesigning cities takes a lot of time and it's very slow. Whereas if we can somehow onboard citizens you know, and, and kind of bring them along with this journey, uh, we actually probably can have like a lot more impact early on. Yeah. Yeah. Which is incredibly important. Yeah. And, and, and I love that too, you know, the prototyping and, uh, the lighter, quicker, cheaper, you know, tactical urbanism approach to be able to at least give folks an opportunity to feel it and taste it and, and, and experience it. Uh, you know, kind of keeps that stuff going. But like you said, you know, the the major, major projects, uh, you know, do take a lot more time. But what we can do uh, in the short term to be able to give folks a chance to be able to see what the future could be like seems like the way to go. Um, that can sometimes drive architects crazy because <laughs> design really, really matters. How do you how do you deal with that tension between needing to be able to to move quickly uh, and definitively in a positive direction versus having things be architecturally perfect? <laughs> yeah, 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 I uh, I know what you're talking about. Um, I think it's a balance because I understand that um, you do need to test things quickly. But I think also there's a point where it needs to be designed and be good. I would give parklets actually as like a very good example of this, where I think now over the last 10 years, we've seen endless iterations of essentially like a very cheap, you know, wooden construction taking up a parking place. And I don't necessarily think that's going to convince large scale transformation. You know, it's very good for us to prove the point that people want to use the space outside shops, especially and restaurants for other purposes. But now I think we need to move beyond that. And it, it doesn't have to be a complete redesign and perfect, but if we're really going to convince people, and we like to talk about this as like um, changing the conversation from what do I have to give up to what do I get in return? Like if we're really going to sell this idea, you know, those pilot projects are going to have to become something a little bit uh, higher quality. So you can see there's that balance, right? You know, short term kind of onboarding and then like scale up to convince people. Yeah. 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 It's, it's fascinating, uh, 
to get, you know, try to get to that balance. And it's also, I think there's a little bit of having a, uh, maybe, maybe it's an intuition or a second sense of seeing when, you know, that, that pilot project or that short-term intervention, or, you know, maybe to use a, an example of a re reimagining what a parking space, a non on street parking space could be, you know, okay, it, it, we're going to eliminate, you know, 600 parking spaces in, in the city center. What are we going to use that space for? Is it going to become activated active mobility space? Is it going to be a, a series of parklets or additional dining for some of the local businesses? And do we, you know, do we do it lighter, quicker, cheaper, and then make that transition? And what does that look like? And when does that transition happen? Uh, it, it seems like there's a little bit of an intuition there in terms of, you know, try to figuring that out. This particular project that you're, I guess you're referring to this one in Copenhagen that we discussed, um, uh, it's actually gone through a long process of uh, citizen involvement. Um, they created what's called like a citizens assembly where they took like representatives from different socio-demographic groups, held a series of workshops. Um, they did like a, a business survey um, to understand what would the effect be. They actually then did a three month trial, uh, essentially closing down these streets and taking away parking places. And I think the whole process was about five years. So if I was a little bit critical, I, I, I like when I've written about this, I, I applaud that they got the job done because taking away parking places is incredibly hard. But if I was to be critical, it's, it's also like a very long time to then take that away. So, you know, if it, if it was going to take five years uh, to do this everywhere, you know, we're, we're talking about the next century before we, uh, you know, see it at a large scale. From a design perspective, should, should our cities be fun? Yes. <laughs> like, I mean, I, I can't imagine what it would, uh, I, I just, I mean, it just, it, 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 it provides so much quality of life to have a fun city. Um, uh, I, I, I mean, Copenhagen is also lauded as, you know, one of the most livable cities in the world. So, you know, we're speaking from an incredibly privileged position. So like, I don't want to undermine what it is, but it's also really enjoyable having, you know, amazing public spaces, like especially in summer, just seeing how active and alive the city is. I can remember, I mean, I, I don't want to contrast it too much, but when I lived in Saudi Arabia, that's, it's a different type of society and they have um, uh, different ways of living, but there, there weren't a lot of public spaces that were generally used. And, and when I contrast that to Copenhagen and just see the way that people are able to meet each other and build kind of a cohesive society, I, I, I can't see why you wouldn't want to encourage that in a lot of places. And so you can see here in this image, I mean, this was actually for a shared uh, scooter company um, where we were providing a vision for them. And, you know, there's a lot of criticism about the way scooters are, um, are parked, about the way that... Um, uh, you know, they're kind of taking away from walking and public transport rather than car use. But we kind of think these are like systematic details that can be ironed out because what scooters are actually a part of is, is you know, this new multimodal transportation system. And, you know, this what this image is trying to actually convey is that they're part of it, right? They're part of a shared car. They're part of a cargo bike. But overall, if we can switch to that system, we can start to create these, you know, residential streetscapes that, you know, we could have children playing on it. I mean, that would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Are you a parent? No. Okay. No. Okay. I was going to, I was going to ask if you were a parent, I was going to say, you know, as a parent, but uh, can you speak to a, a little bit of what we see um, in Copenhagen and, you know, in Denmark in general, the culture of being able to create an environment where children can be more free range, can have a sense of independence and, and how important the built environment is to you know, facilitate that. Yeah, when I first moved here, I was actually shocked with the amount of independence that children have. Um, there are anecdotes, actually. Well, no, uh, I have a story, uh, but one of the cultural things that they do in Denmark is they leave babies outside in prams, uh, especially in winter, just on their own. So it's not uncommon to be walking down the street and just see a pram by itself. But because the society is quite trustworthy, they... Um, uh, they feel fine to do it. Uh, there was a Danish woman in New York, though, that left her kid outside and went into a, a cafe and she was actually arrested. 
um, <laughs> which, yeah, 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 exactly. But that's like a cultural kind of misalignment. But um, it's just, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. Like, I mean, even the way that curb cuts, uh, generally would we kind of understand that here, what a curb cut is? Like um, the, uh, the pedestrian walkway continues over. So like um, pedestrians always, always have right of way when, except at like uh, traffic lights, but at most kind of intersections, like a pedestrian will have right of way. And I mean, you, you must know about um, the Danish openness, Jan Gell. I think he's quite- oh, yeah. uh, yeah. yeah, quite well known. And one of his big comments is that, that he loves the fact that he feels uh, fine that his um, kind of grandkids are, are freely able to walk to school because he knows that, you know, they're kind of prioritized the wrong way. And when you give children that independence to be walk, able to walk to school, I mean, you know, that's incredibly liberating, not only for the child who can gain some independence and grow up in a world where they're free to, to do other things, but also for the parents that, you know, don't then have to incorporate that child's journey to school, which is probably pretty walkable, you know, into their busy morning, right? It kind of frees up everyone. Um, yeah, yeah. I've I've had the honor to 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 meet uh, Jan a, a couple of times, and uh, one of the quotes that he has that I I just absolutely adore and love uh, dates back over a decade ago to a a documentary uh, called Contested Streets uh, that he was featured in. And he talked about the fact that uh, it's such a wonderful, it's a joy to wake up every day and know that your city is just a little bit better than it was the day before. And, uh, and hopefully that, that trend can continue. And hopefully uh, some of the silly ideas <laughs> that get put forth uh, don't undermine the, the decades worth of incremental improvement uh, that has happened uh, in Copenhagen and in cities around the globe that are taking steps to become more livable, uh, more sustainable, and hopefully we can keep that momentum going. And thank you so much for uh, everything that you're doing uh, and, and Yaya is doing to facilitate that progress and keeping it going. And thank you so much for uh, joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's been an absolute joy. Ah, uh, well, thanks for having me, John. It's been a real pleasure. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Robert Martin. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up. <laughs> Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just hit that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell next to it to select your notification preferences. And if you're enjoying this content, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. It really helps me out a great deal. And... Uh, helps me continue to bring this content to you each week. <laughs> Thank you all so much for tuning in and for whatever support you're able to provide. Oh, and don't forget, I do have plenty of Street Surfer People uh, swag out on the Active Towns website. Again, that link is in the video description down below and in the show notes. Thank you all so much. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.